ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the gig member Q&A call. Today is Tuesday, April 25th. Uh, your host, Scott Massey and James Cronk with you. And James, when I was planning for uh, today's call, you know, prepping and getting ready, you know, I was thinking back to, you know, the concept of gig. And when we first started out, the idea was always to try and connect with, you know, the very best in our industry, the, the best leaders, uh, the best in the business and whatever, you know, area of expertise they had and connect with those folks and create great content uh, to help clubs be better. And, you know, when you think about today's guest, uh, there couldn't be a better example of that. Uh, I am really excited to get to chat with Henry Brunton today and learn a little bit more about him, uh, his business, all the successes that he's had in his journey to where he finds himself today. So, you know, in the spirit of what gig is all about, I think today's call, today's Q&A call is uh, the very best example of what of what we're trying to do. And so I'm super excited for today. Master professional. Yeah. You know, best in country by Golf Digest. No question. You know, coached and developed four world junior champions, uh, NCAA champions, you know, web.com, PGA, LPGA tours. Uh, I mean, Henry has academies in United States and Canada. Uh, you know, Scott, I, I am, I am, you know, what I love as well is one of the things we've also talked about is when we get into the specialization, you know, like we're able to interview gurus that are experts in their niche, like in their yeah. specialization, right? We exactly. as generalists get to kind of learn a little bit about a lot, but, mm -hmm. but we get to interview people that are, that are specialists in their area. And Henry Brunton is one of those individuals, Scott, I was in Halifax, um, a few weeks ago, speaking to 60 or so golf professionals and men and women in the crowd. And Henry was the other presenter. And, and I was just, uh, my mouth was open listening to his, his knowledge about teaching people, teaching juniors, high, high um, athlete development, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm so thrilled to have Henry as our special guest. And let's bring him on. Absolutely. Henry, welcome to the gig live Q&A call, sir. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with you both. So tell us, uh, which which academy are you at today? Whereabouts are you hanging your hat today, your Titleist hat? And uh, and and where, where are you today, Henry? I'm in uh, Orlando, Florida today. We have a uh, high performance academy in Orlando, Florida, which maybe we'll talk about a little later. Uh, we have an academy in Southern California at Strawberry Farms Golf Club in Irvine, California. And we have our academy at Eagles Nest Golf Club. But this is our starting our 18th year there. Uh, we're opening the outdoor season actually on Friday. So uh, nice. I'll be heading back to Toronto uh, in 10, to 10 days or so to join the team there for the exciting 2023 outdoor season. Well, so let's let's get you set up at uh, one of our golf courses in British Columbia, Henry. And then you've got the four corners. <laughs> you've got, you know, East Coast, West Coast, South and North, right? If we can yeah. we can make that happen. I'd love it. Love love uh, love British Columbia. So Henry, uh, I mentioned a couple of things earlier on, but but uh, please take a moment to share with our our listeners and our audience. Um, about your journey, and 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 uh, and I know it's been a journey with lots of different stops along the way, and and lots of uh, accomplishments. And I know you're a humble gentleman. I, I I've you know met you and talked to you, but I'm going to ask you to don't be humble here and and share because to give some perspective. Because one of the things that I loved about what you said when I listened to you speak a while ago was reminding young golf professionals how many things they can do in the golf industry and in the golf world. And you're, you're a testament to that. So um, share, share with our listeners, Henry, a little bit about your journey and your, and your achievements. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. I mean, I'm just like everybody else. I'm just a, a PGA professional who loves the game. And, and I found my, my real, you know, raging passion is with teaching and coaching and developing academies and not only developing players, but developing the future generation of coaches and PGA instructors. So that's, really where my heart is and where my my passion lies. Uh, I started out, uh, I'm from the Ottawa Valley. I'm from a little tiny town called Kempville, Ontario. 
uh, like so many PGA pros, grew up on a nine hole golf course. It was Augusta National to us. We didn't know any better, and it's still Augusta National to us. It's called Rideau Glen Golf Club. I was very lucky to bump into a PGA of Canada member. David Inch was a young professional there, and we didn't know, uh, you know, one end of the club from the other. And David helped us learn the game, fall in love with the game, and and uh, he inspired me to do. Uh, things that I'm doing today. So I, I worked and, and played at that little golf course uh, in Kempville, Ontario. And then as luck would have it, I bumped into, uh, you know, one of Canada's greatest golf pros ever, Paul Sherritt at Rideau View Golf Club in Manitick, Ontario, which is uh, 20 miles away from, or so from Kempville, uh, an 18 hole private club. I was very lucky to be uh, mentored by Paul for over 10 years. I worked for Paul for 10 years, including uh, the last five of which as a, an apprentice golf professional. And so that that really helped me uh, on my journey uh, as we know it now. I also went to the University of Ottawa concurrently while working for Paul and studied uh, physical education and sports science. And I was on a different track than all the other students. And I was lucky that I had professors that recognized that and allowed me to do a lot of work uh, in the golf area. So again, a lot of good people supporting me over the years to uh, to help me get to to you know to where I am today, I left uh, Rideau View Golf Club in in Manitick, Ontario, to work for Bruce Murray uh, and Bob Hogarth at the Royal Montreal Golf Club in 1990. So the first two years I worked for Bruce Murray. I know Bruce came out to Vancouver and was at Shaughnessy, and Bob Hogarth came in in 1992 uh, from uh, Royal Callwood. Great, both great guys, both tremendous professionals, both had strengths. Uh, I was very lucky at Royal Montreal. I was hired to be a traditional assistant professional who start, who was teaching a little bit at the uh, after a shift. And early on, I got the chance to be a full time teacher, which was really kind of at that time uh, cutting edge. There weren't many, if any, uh, especially young people that were teaching full time. So I got got my reps in at Royal Montreal. Unbelievable membership. Great people. I worked uh, the last two years with Scott Dixon, who is now the general manager at Royal Montreal. Scott's had a wonderful journey himself and then left. I left uh, Montreal in, in 1995 to go to work at Clublink, this new thing called Clublink in Toronto, which was a world away for me. I was hired to be the uh, head professional at Emerald Hills Golf Club, and I was the head professional there, but I also was in charge of the SCORE Golf Schools program that they had a partnership with SCORE Golf Schools. So being involved with Bob Weeks's group and, and conducting SCORE Golf Schools all over Ontario was a really a uh, key piece for me. It gave me the exposure, got experience, uh, and, and that worked out extremely well for me. I left uh, Club Link to work at Lionhead Golf Club uh, in 1996. Uh, at uh, Lionhead, I was lucky we had uh, people running the golf operations, so kind of in tune with uh, you, you know your gig, your gig business. Uh, they saw a different future for the golf professional. They hired retail people. They hired operations people. They wanted me to be the face of the golf club, but most importantly, to develop an academy. And we did that there. And we had a lot of success. We had a, a team of 16 PGA professionals, and we did a lot of innovative things. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, built it up to, to a very high level. And then that segued me uh, into being entertained to, to join, uh, the, at that time, called the Royal Canadian Golf Association, now called Golf Canada, who then owned Glen Abbey to run uh, the Glen Abbey Academy of Golf. At that time, it was it was a very small uh, piece of what they were doing. They wanted to take that to a new level, but also they wanted to dip their toe into uh, player development to see if if Canada's golfers wanted to be supported, if that could work, if there was uh, if it was going to happen politically, given uh, Golf Canada and the PGA of Canada, etc. And the good news is that it all worked out extremely well, as I think everyone's aware now, seeing all the fantastic things that our players and coaches are doing. So I worked at, at Glen Abbey uh, and I also worked uh, for the PGA of Canada, uh, taking the teaching and coaching certification program. I had the um, the ability to, to uh, uh, the, the green light to, to basically start all over again. And we built the uh, teaching and coaching certification program. We rolled it out nationally and that has uh, continued to be, uh, you know, a very highly respected uh, program for golf professionals uh, globally. Um, I left uh, Golf Canada after 13 years in 2011. I loved my time at Golf Canada. It was it was phenomenal, um, and and uh, left there in 2011. And then I started on my journey towards uh, more academies. I've 
partnered with Dr. Rick Jensen. Rick uh, is from Florida. He and I have done a lot of work in the past, done a lot of work in the past. He had a program called Certified Golf Coaches Association in the United States, which is training golf professionals. So we teamed up and, and we conducted programs uh, primarily in New York, Chicago, LA, and Florida. We've trained over 500 top level uh, PGA professionals, LPGA professionals to, to be better coaches, to earn a better living, live a better life, if you will. Um, and then I ventured out on my own in 2015 with an academy in uh, Irvine, California at Strawberry Farms. It's a wonderful place. And we've been there now, hard to believe, eight years. And and uh, without saying too much about our team, this is a team award. We've just been uh, given the award as the uh, Golf Academy of the Year now four years in a row, which puts us in the their quote unquote Hall of Fame for best in class. So our academy in Southern California is very robust. We have nine full time uh, coaches they do a wonderful job we touch a lot of people from junior development to new to golf to uh, all sorts of specialized programs that's a lot of fun and then my wife Rhonda Fleury she's my partner she's a PGA professional a fine player in her own right she and I have been really focused here in Florida since 2015 on our high performance program we wanted to offer uh, young golfers uh, an opportunity that we didn't have in our day and that is primarily canadians but anybody can come here we have Euro some european players we have some american players uh, who are junior golfers aspiring to be ncaa athletes who come and live and train here in florida so we've got uh, a customized program where they they have a phenomenal opportunity and they love it they do really well and it's fun to watch them uh, grow and excel. So we've been doing that since uh, 2015. And as I said, I'm heading back up to Toronto in two weeks to start the outdoor season at Eagle's Nest. Wow. wow. And uh, and so much, so much going on and so much uh, you're, you've got, here you are running three businesses, uh, really, I'm sure academies that are in different parts of the North America. Henry, when you were telling that story about your stops along the way and when you kind of became that director of instruction, so to speak, I think at Royal Montreal maybe was your your first kind of focus. Did you always feel like teaching was? Were you did you gravitate to kind of instruction and teaching the game and 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 that was you you knew that from early on that was one of your passions. Yeah, I, yes, yeah, so I, I knew early on working uh, for Paul Sherrod at Rideau View Golf Club. Yeah, I loved everything about the golf business, but my true passion, my burning desire was to help people get better at their game. And so that, and so I dovetailed that with my formal education at the University of Ottawa and then took every, I've taken every conceivable <laughs> uh, professional development opportunity in golf and outside of golf with other sports to try to try to get better at it. I'm trying to get better at it every day still. Um, I think our, our, I threw our next question in there, Scott, because um when we talk about instruction and we talk about academies and, and I want to, I've got some questions for you later on, I think about, about how you put your academy together in particular, the one in Florida, because it's so interesting for young people that, as you said, are focused on hopefully aspiring to play college golf or, or, or even further than that. But uh, in, in the presentation you gave a few weeks ago, Henry in Halifax, you uh, you, you, someone asked a question from the audience about playing on the tour, and you, and we, and we had a couple tour players that were in the room, and and you, you gave a, a little stat or a story, and I, it just resonated with me so much because I'd never heard someone describe it that way. Could you, could you share with our listeners just, just how difficult is it to make? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. My pleasure. So, I mean, we all know it's difficult to get to the highest end of. Of professional sports everyone obviously knows that uh, I had that question burning in my mind and when I did my PGA of Canada master professional research paper thesis I explored that and if anyone's interested they can log on to my website and and they it's a free download there's a full-length version of the paper if they're interested or there's an executive summary uh, I wanted to know you know what are the odds of an elite male player making the PGA tour and uh, I went through it uh, in detail, uh, kind of nerded out on it, if you will. But to, to make it very simple, for any given birth year, uh, there will be approximately 10 males who have a bona fide career as PGA Tour professionals. So a bona fide career, meaning uh, five or more years of keeping their cards. Uh, that was the, you know, that was that was the uh, acid test. And so 
10 people around the globe are likely to have a career like that for every birth year. Of those 10 people, seven are likely to be US born. So you have three people worldwide for any given birth year who are fighting for those incredibly valuable spots to be world-class PGA Tour players. So it's an unbelievable accomplishment for anyone to get onto any tour, but for someone to be a Nick Taylor, an Adam Hadwin, a Taylor Pendrith, uh, and on and on, all of our Canadian guys, Adam Svensson and Corey Connors and Mackenzie Hughes, and amazing we can say those names now. Uh, they all used to be juniors uh, at one time under my watch. And so to, to see that kind of uh, traction and excellence is just incredible. Also, James, and people at Golf Canada didn't like this, but it's the, the stats are the stats. A country like Canada should produce a PGA Tour player about once every 11 years. So the fact that we have this incredible blip, you know, it used to be we had Dave Barr, Dan Halderson, Richard Zockel, um, yeah, and, yeah. and so on, and, and Ray Stewart, et cetera. There was, there's, but now we see this uh, bizarre, um, you know, exciting time in Canadian golf, but we, we need to know that this is uh, this is bizarre. It's it, it really shouldn't happen once every 11 years, given the size of our all the factors. Um, so it, was, it takes an awful lot of hard work and a lot of resources spent the right way to give our players a chance to do this. But it's it's not easy. It's not a home run. And it is an incredible accomplishment for those that that uh, get to the pinnacle. It wasn't it was, we were, Scott, you mentioned we're recording this on April 25th. I mean, literally a few days ago, we've got two guys playing in the Zurich Classic from the same golf club in the <laughs> Abbotsford, British Columbia from what, what is a wonderful track, a golf course called Ledgeview, but it's a hidden gem out in the way. And what are the odds, Henry? It's kind of completely goes against all that stuff, but it's true. And, you know, you and I have been around long enough. Scott's a bit younger, but you and I have been around long enough to to remember the, you know, the player development program that that the PGA of Canada, Golf Canada, were were promoting and talking about, and 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 I mean it's true, isn't it? Really, the 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 bear of the, the result of that fruit of labor is is these number of individuals, the like you said, the Taylor Pendrith and the many others that are playing on on the tour these days. And as you said, you you saw lots of them, didn't you, when they were when they were just young little whippersnappers. Whacking balls on the driving range. Yes. No, we, you know, it was a concerted effort. Doug Roxborough from Vancouver. Doug and I worked together for 11 years. Um, we, we formed a great partnership. Doug brought so many strengths and such phenomenal experience. We worked together to build a system that is standing the test of time. And Derek Ingram is doing a wonderful job with Tristan Mullally taking, taking the reins from us. Um, but the infrastructure being set is so important. And then spending the resources, because as much as we have for resources, there really needs to be, they have to be spent wisely. Or you don't get returned. So hats off to everybody that's continuing on. And it's, you know, again, really big time hats, hats off to the guys and gals that are living the dream, if you will, because it is a crazy difficult thing. Just think of that 10 people per birth year worldwide are going to be those players. It's, it's a, it's a crazy thing. <clears throat> Henry, when, when you, Talk about instruction and you think about golf professionals and, and golf professionals that are teaching people to play the game. Because we just, you know, talk about obviously developing the best of the best of the best. You know, there's the Sean Foley's of the world that are walking the driving range at PGA Tour events. And then there's the, you know, the Susan Smiths of the world walking the driving range in the public nine-hole golf course, teaching Mrs. Jones how to get the ball airborne. So recognizing that there's so many different layers to instruction, but in your experience working with so many and training so many golf professionals, what do you think are, are, are kind of the core qualities, you know, that if you're a 22 year old and you want to kind of become a teacher of, of golf, you know, what, what are those qualities, those characteristics, those values that, that, that are similar in your opinion of, 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 of a good teaching profession? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a great question. 
people that are, are going to be in this space in the teaching and coaching world and and develop careers especially in a country like canada where we have our you know i know it better than anybody the challenges with weather etc um the people that excel and become very good number one uh, no surprise they love the game they just love everything about the game the sport they can't get enough of it uh, they're not looking to take days off they they they're upset when it's a rainy day. So they have phenomenal energy, enthusiasm, passion. They love to play the game. They're looking at ways to help other people get better. Uh, the, the, yeah, they want to make a good living. Who doesn't? But that's really not what that's not what's driving them. What's driving them is helping other people getting better. And they're feeding off the positive energy that they're getting from other people and building the game in their own at their own club, in their own area. Mm -hmm. And they get an awful lot of satisfaction from that. So the people that are that are really doing well in this space love the sport. They, they still want to play their best. They, they they still want to compete if they can. They and they're looking to get better. They're 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 searching out other mentors that can help them. And they're looking outside of just our own sport. They're looking to other experts and other fields to help understand how we can get better at teaching. Because uh, as far as along as teaching and coaching has come in golf, it's still very new. And there's a lot of fertile ground that we can cover to, to make it better for sure. Well, well, you talked about kind of, you know, instruction and, and newness. And, and um, I mean, I remember taking my PGA of Canada lab tests, you know, and, and, and trying, trying to, trying to get my class A card and, you know, I, I I apologize to anyone that's ever taken a lesson from me. Unfortunately, I'm Henry. I, I must admit, I'm, uh, from a from a golf professional standpoint, I failed the instruction side, but I ended up obviously focusing in other areas. But um, but one of the things that I think is amazing now is is there's so much information out there about teaching golf, and and then also today's golfer can go online and you know watch 400 videos about how to cure their slice and and how to cure their, you know, the fix their themselves. Do you think that's making it difficult? And, you know, is it more challenging to be an instructor today with all the technology and the information that's kind of out there and even the role of technology in, in golf itself, you know, like, so how, how, how is it different now with regards to instructing someone and, and, and with, with all that information that they now have available at their fingertips? Well, it's, you know, it's really, James, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, the good news is the information is available to all of us. And so today's, you know, high-level teaching professional coach that's really focused on this piece of the business, um, we, can, we, can make, we can get the information that we want much easier. We used to have to travel and all sorts of things just to, just to access information. Now there is so much more and so many great resources and sources for this information so that's wonderful for us as the practitioners as you mentioned it can be very dangerous both for the both for the coach and the students the students can come to uh, coaching sessions with uh, as you mentioned so many youtube videos and information and, and much of it can be completely not not the best uh, as putting it mildly and also they also have a lot of knowledge which makes them dangerous as students asking the coach, well, you know, what about spin loft? What, you know, all these new things in golf, if, if someone's on up to speed, they might uh, leave that, that coach or they might, the coach might look bad. So it ma makes you responsible as a coach to stay on ahead of the curve. It makes us really, um, I guess, to be leaders, to realize that technology is incredible, but if we overuse it or use it inappropriately, it has a negative correlation for learning. So it's a it's a people business being with someone with their own golf game that's a very big responsibility for a coach every person is different no two people are going to do it the same way so it's really important that the coach knows how and when and and, and in what in what manner to use to use technology whether it's video or track man or force plates or whatever it might be and there's so many great tools but the bottom line is coaching is really about a relationship between someone that is an expert in helping others learn and acquire skills. That's different than teaching. They help them learn to be more skillful and the golfer that's looking to, to get more skillful. And, you know, one of the big things that we fight as a, you know, Dr. Jensen and I fight with 
to not fight, but we, we battle in the industry is that people come to a golf coaching session, a lesson thinking that James Cronk or Henry Brunton uh, or Kevin Thistle, whoever the pro might be, uh, is going to fix them in 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And it just doesn't happen that way. There's no magic pill. Uh, it's all about building blocks for the future. And a coaching session is about, you know, learning, exploring, understanding more, and then going out and applying it on your own with practice and play. And that's really, really important that there's a differentiator with that because a lot of young teachers feel that they feel pressure that if, if Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones comes for a, a lesson, the boy, they better be better by the time they finish with them or you haven't done a good job. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what do you, what's your thoughts on the, I mean, there's obviously pros and cons, but obviously lots of instruction now happens in a simulator, you know, I mean, you don't see the ball go further than five yards in front of you. Sometimes that's weather related. Sometimes it's, is it better than nothing? Or do you think it's, it's, what's your thought about, you know, that, that option now for, for instruction that's not seeing the full ball flight. Do you think it matters? Well, again, it really doesn't matter what I think, but what the research would show very clearly is that ideally you want to teach and learn and coach the game in the environment in which it's played. So clearly if we can be outdoors off turf with real balls, that's the ideal scenario. It isn't always po possible for everybody. I get that. I understand that, especially for us in Canada where we have so much bad weather. So being indoors using a simulator with today's technology can be fantastic if it's if you recognize what it's really good for it's great for making sure people get terrific setup patterns really good club delivery patterns um, but thinking you're playing at pebble beach on a simulator hey it's fun it's it's entertainment but you're not playing pebble beach you're not in ice plant you're not in kakuya grass it's it's so we shouldn't try to make it what it's not but say what a wonderful place to uh, develop flexibility, mobility, great ball striking patterns to get feedback and how far it's going. But it, it's still not the real thing. Uh, Dr. Tim Lee, who's a Canadian, uh, one of the great motor skills uh, researchers and, and professors from Hamilton, Ontario, told me, he said, Henry, whatever you do, tell the coaches to make it like you play it. When you're teaching and coaching, make it like you play it the mo as much as you can. And he's a very good golfer himself in his own right. And so, of course, um, I get worried with today's technology. You see such an influx of indoor coaching studios. Again, phenomenal opportunity to build great fundamentals, confidence, ball striking patterns. But you need to get out of there just like a pilot has to get into a real plane and fly the plane in the real world. Uh, if we only hit inside, I think we're limiting our possibilities. In, in that vein, and, and we're going to, I think the next question is about teaching junior golfers, but I think that it's, it's, um, Scott, I think it's relevant to any instruction. And I know you were sharing a little bit about your philosophy with, and Dr. Jensen's kind of concepts. I, and I know it's not something you can kind of describe in, you know, three minutes or less, but, but what are, one of the things, for example, you talked about was exactly that about, you know, do you go to the range and hit 97 five irons over and over again? Or do you go driver, five iron wedge, you know, driver, five iron wedge kind of thing? What, what are some of, what are some of the philosophies that at your academies, you teach, you know, you would, you would discuss, someone said, tell me about your teaching style, your teaching philosophy, how, how to, how to coach junior successfully, Henry, why should I come to your academy versus Academy XYZ in, in, in down the street. What what are what are your what? How would you answer that? Well, what we really believe that that we're trying to develop not only a great golfer but a great person at the same time. So we're focused on on the entire person who becomes the best golfer they can be. It's a long term approach that is focused on the essential skills of golf, which is first and foremost. If you're going to be a great golfer, you've got to control the golf ball. The flight, the trajectory, the distance, the spin, that's great golfers. That's what they do. They control the golf ball and they, they, they minimize their errors. And of course, they have razor sharp short games so they can recover from bad places. We all know that all of us that are in the game. There's also a whole. So people 
oftentimes we'll focus on those things. That isn't revolutionary. But the things that would make us different is that we're all about the, the performance side. So making sure that that they learn, you know, an essential skill is, you know, your thought control. What are you supposed to be thinking about? How do you quiet your mind? How do you quiet the internal environment and allow the best athlete that's inside you to perform when it counts? Or, or, or are you interfering with yourself? So teaching that all that entire side of the mental game and, and accessing, you know, your best golf uh, that you can play. And then there's the, of course, there's the, there's the execution piece where it's all about, you know, what are the right shots to play? Where should you hit the ball? What should you do to um, shoot your lowest score? So for example, our golfers, I showed our young athletes the other day, I showed them some stats that showed that, uh, Zero handicap players, you know, excellent, you know, club champion type players. Six percent of the time hit a ball over a green. Only six percent. Most golfers are missing short almost all day long. They're playing for their very best shots rather than their average shots or median shots. So we help our golfers understand, you know, when it's appropriate, if they're feeling great and they have an open shot with a wedge or a short club. OK, go for a tuck pin. But otherwise, we're helping them navigate around the golf course to hit as many greens in regulation as they can and picking targets that if they miss the targets, give them the best chance of getting up and down. So obviously shooting lower scores. So those are the kind of things that we work with these athletes to develop all those skill sets. It takes time. Um, we've got a young golfer uh, in the academy and she is from Saskatchewan. She's going to be a terrific She's going to win provincial championships. She's going to be an NCAA golfer. Well, she shot 92 this weekend in a tournament. I watched her play, and she played actually really well for most of the game. Her good stuff is really good. Right now, her bad stuff is crushing her, including her short putting, etc. But her dad would look at the scorecard and go, oh, my God, she's an idiot. She shot 92. And I said to the gentleman, I said, look, she – you can shoot 92 and play very, very poorly. We've all seen that and done that, but this was not that case. They're learning, they're developing. And we look at them, not where they are right now, but where will they be in 20 tournaments and making sure the building blocks are correctly in place so they can keep building their own game. And every golfer will, will approach it differently and, and will play differently, but you have to put the ball in the hole. That is clearly what the game is all about in competitive golf. If, uh, if a parent comes to you, um, what advice would you give a golf instructor on how to manage expectations of parents of kids that show some promise, some skill? Well, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time on this, as you alluded to earlier. I've written two books. One is called Journey to Excellence, and I'm not trying to plug a book. I'm just saying, hey, there's some great information in that book called Journey to Excellence. So if a parent could get you know, get a book like that or that book that talks about, hey, Johnny just fell in love with golf. He's a good golfer. And now what, 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 what's the, you know, what's the, what's the development platform like? So understand how, it, how development happens, understand what, what uh, a parent should be doing, how they should be supporting, how they, you know, pitfalls to avoid if they could. And to really give the coach um, the time and the relationship with the athlete without the parent around let the parent uh, be in the background the best parents and my research shows that uh they fade into the background they support yeah they're they're making everyone accountable but they're not on the lesson team watching the lesson they're not asking hey what did what did scott do in the lesson today how can i make him better they're not um doing all those things so realizing that it's a journey to take a young athlete from you know becoming a new competitive golfer uh, to becoming a high-level junior and a collegiate player and a pro down the road. And so the coach needs to understand that they need to manage the expectations and the relationship with the entire family and make a plan and then execute the plan and realize that, hey, that young golfer that shot 92 this weekend, and, and I can't wait for her to start shooting 72, and she will, but it might take two years. We don't know that. She might. She's capable of shooting – 75 next week we, we don't know that but if we focus on the essential skills controlling the flight trajectory and spin and distance of the golf ball managing thoughts and emotions being able to calm over the ball and and hit to pictures with with good external thoughts and then having the you know presence of mind 
to chart your way around a golf course like you're playing chess, playing to your strengths, avoiding the pitfalls to shoot your lowest scores. Those are those are the things that coaches should be doing. And and in fairness, in, in, in the model right now is that a lot of coaches think it's all about if the person has a good looking swing. And hey, that's it's obviously important to have a good swing, but that's that's not who uh, that's not who wins the tournaments. It's the people that can do it all. On that vein, when you have a junior that comes to you and has a swing like Matthew Wolf, you know, do you do you try to? I mean, obviously, there's fundamentals of a swing, but like you said, it's like it's like the score, it's like results. I assume there's certain things you care about and certain things you don't care about, whether where the club goes, wherever it is during the hitting impact zone. Um, you know, when you talk about kind of an instructor. I mean, is that the measure of a good instructor is creating good swings or creating good results? I assume it's well, uh, great, great coaching in, in our estimation is creating, providing great environments for learning and developing and allow not being having a fixed mindset where everyone has to swing like uh, Nick Faldo or Nick Taylor or whomever the great player is today. Um, so if, if Matthew Wolf, um, can hit the ball out of the center of the club face all day long and hit with power and control the flight, let him swing that way. Don't, don't change that. Um, so what coaches need to do or what we strongly encourage them to do is, is like any good practitioner in any profession is to assess the athlete. Okay. What can they do really well? Identify their strengths. Uh, and then what are their highest priorities to make improvements to get the ball in the hole faster. So, hey, if Matthew Wolf came hypothetically, and my God, he can hit it squarely and solidly. He's got great control and power. Maybe he's uh, maybe he needs to work on his trajectory control with his 70, 80, and 90 yard wedges. Maybe he hits those too high. Uh, maybe he can't spin the ball out of the bunker properly. Maybe he has a very uh, you know doesn't ha hasn't learned really good green reading skills. Maybe he doesn't know how to chart a golf course correctly. So you find the skills that they need to develop. If they can hit it, hit it solidly and hit it, hit it uh, with confidence, then let them keep doing that. And, and look at, you know, there's so much to do in this sport to, you know, to sharpen all the, sharpen all the different teeth on the saw, if you will, to, to play your best golf. It isn't just about hitting it well, but of course you have to hit it really well to compete, but that's not everybody that plays really well can hit it. It's the other things that separate them. Henry, your, your brand, you know, you've created your golf academy, your brand. And, and you know, I, I always, you know, try to remind people that your brand is what they say about you when you leave the room. Right? You, you, can't, you can't just manufacture your brand. You have to actually live it and deliver it. And, you know, if, if you don't have anyone that's improving in the game of golf, don't worry about your brand on the international stage. But... You are going to kind of give some advice to a young professional or, or someone that aspires to have their own academy in, you know, multiple countries one day. Well, 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 now that you've had a chance to kind of, you know, look back and you've, you know, you've lived it, you've done it. You're here. You are you're, you. You have the, you have your brand and it's an incredibly uh, respected and strong one. Did it just happen for you? Did, did you, did you, make some strategies along the way? Did you make some choices along the way that, um, you know, you would, you would tell someone to, to follow if they were going to map out what's the best way to create a successful brand in your, in, in either in your community or around the world? Well, I didn't start out uh, trying to create a brand uh, and I still don't really feel that way. I think that the way that you, have success and, and, and you have a lot of fun is by making the people that you are lucky enough to work with, help them get better, help those people that you work with that are in front of you, get better, show them that you care about them because you love golf and you really want people that uh, you're working with to enjoy it to the fullest. And if you do that at your club level, you do it at your regional level, provincial level, it will just naturally, if you're doing it, with your heart and you're doing it be, and you're good at it and you're getting results and people are enjoying it, it will naturally organically just happen. If people try to, you know, take a class on how to create a brand and they build a website and they, you know, a great example is uh, someone said to me, 
a while ago at a different conference. You go, oh my God, Butch Harmon, what a, what a horrible website. I go, are you kidding me? Butch Harmon is one of the greatest, if not the greatest coaches ever lived in golf. Nobody cares about his damn website. He's authentic. He's real. He's a fantastic player, a great coach. He gets results. And so I think the advice I would give my fellow professionals is that, yeah, just take care of people in front of you. Don't get carried away with social media and trying to get, uh, you know, trying to get a, some sort of a, a hit that goes viral and, and, and trying to make things up that make you different, that, you know, can be a negative. Because in this world of sports science, if you're saying things that you're kind of making up and they get disproven, you can look very foolish very quickly. So it's just being authentic, loving the people that are in front of you, and then innovating, finding ways that truly help them get better. So, for example, uh, just before we came on the call, I'm going to be sending out a, a newsletter to our Toronto Academy members, and I'm going to personally be transitioning to primarily two-hour coaching sessions. Um, so we're going to call them performance coaching sessions for adults, be a maximum of four people in the group, so it's constant personal attention. So they get to come for two hours for a, a lower fee than it would be for a one-hour private lesson. So it's much more cost-effective for them, much more of a value um, proposition for the golfer. But more importantly, they're going to be in that learning and training environment for much more time, which means that if I do a good job of setting up the environment and organizing the training and, and coaching activities, they're going to get much, much better than they will if they come and see me for one hour for a private lesson. So I'm still going to offer private lessons. There are some people who just want that, but I'm going to do my best to shift to as many performance coaching sessions as I can. And I know they're going to love it because we've done it before and I'm excited about doing it. So again, uh, innovate. Don't do it the same way that we always do it because we always do it that way. How can we touch more of our, our members or more of our golfers um, in a really, you know, you know, really firm handshake way. We can use things like Zoom. So we're going to be doing some Zoom training this spring with uh, talking about, okay, here are the five essential mental game things we should be working on. I'm not talking about championship golfers. I'm talking about regular, ardent, everyday golfers. They don't know these things. Those are the things that aren't being talked about on YouTube. Uh, you know, making sure people have clarity of information, clarity of purpose when they're over the ball, because all this information out there can be a real negative for golfers. They get so confused and, and, and then they get flummoxed. And then, of course, they, they hit a downward spiral. Well, in that similar vein, um, like when you have a group of instructors, and I, I think, Scott, this is the next question because it leads right into it. When, when you have a group of instructors, I mean, one of the things that I always find so interesting is that is that – you can have 10 instructors in 10 different ways to teach the game, right? 10, 10 different ways they set up a lesson, 10 different ways that they take someone through a series of five, 10 different ways that they, you know, believe is the way to, to, to improve your putting. With regards to that, like, do you think that's a good thing for the game of golf that there are, there is not one way, or do you think that more unification and consistency and, the way that we, you know, do you think that that has hindered people's ability to learn the game and to and to enjoy the game, which we know makes them play the game longer and stay in the game, et cetera, et cetera, because it's so frustrating? Or do you think it's good for everyone to find their own way? Well, I'll tell you what we do, James, in our academies is is I've written a, a book called the uh, the learning our academy learning guide. So I wrote the wrote the learning guide to help golfers get clarity and, and, and give them information they can use and, 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 and apply in their everyday game. Also to highlight what coaches are going to be doing with them if they're involved in coaching programs. So in our, in our learning guide, which is a free download, by the way, from our website, if anyone's interested in, in, in acquiring it, they're very welcome. Um, we basically say these are the, foundational pieces of learning to be better at golf. This is how you acquire skill. This is how you should consider practicing. This is uh, how you should approach playing and developing the game and developing your game. Now, the, every coach is going to be different. Everyone's got a different personality. Everyone, we, we expect them all to deliver it with their own style and zeal. But we don't have any, we have no 
it's non-negotiable to make up your own stuff that isn't based in sports science. That's where the big disconnect has been, James, is that in, in the past, golf golfers, golf professionals could kind of make up what they thought they were doing or just kind of make it up and nobody called them on it. So we want our coaches to, to, to sing from a song sheet that is rooted in, in motor learning, skills acquisition, science, so that people are, it's, it's, it's real. And let the coaches have their own way of delivering it and getting to the same end point, which is people finding their own best swing, playing their best golf and enjoying the process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you've obviously done a lot of that with regards to your, your history and your time uh, and, and, and putting things together. I know that um, you were sharing it once again with us. And I think it's a question that's coming up, Scott, about fee setting and setting fees and, and, and you've got a program as well with your academy in Florida, Henry. Like, how, how has it changed? You know, uh, you just talked about your two-hour lesson plan for Eagle's Nest. And we, we think about the old days of, you know, it's whatever. It's 60 bucks an hour or buy five hours and, you know, it's 50 bucks an hour, whatever it is. What do you see are the successful trends with regards to instructors how does one person charge double what another person charges? Why, why should a golfer see value in that or not? You know, uh, if you, if the widgets are all different, how do you charge different prices? So what's your philosophy or what are your thoughts? Or what guidance could you give, you know, around, around the aspect of charging for your services? It's, it's, it's not easy to do. Well, you know, James, your talk in Halifax was amazing. I, I hope every golf professional gets to hear you speak. The, the more that you can influence the, the game and, and, the, and, and the business, it's, it's just great stuff. And it dovetails with, with what we're, we're experiencing, what we're doing in our academy. So um, at our academies, um, we're focused on being finding people that want long-term relationships that are not transactional in nature. So the old... Um, you know, model where you're trying to find a guy to give you whatever, $200 for five, whatever the number is, five lessons. And it's wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And there's no accountability for performance or development. And it's, it's just in and out. That's not good for the golfer, not good for the professional, not good for the, for the profession. Uh, so what we do at our Academy, and again, I'm not saying it's right, but it does work very well for us is when we get a new prospective client, they will, they will email us or call us, obviously, I will personally, almost every time call that person and, and ask them, hey, thanks for your interest in, in, in the academy. What makes you want to get better? Want to know this person? What they're, Why are they coming to us? What are they looking for? So we can get them in the right program and with the right coach that might match who they are. So that initial, that initial piece is who are they? What are they coming to us for? And then we explain to them that we're all about developing long-term relationships that get measurable results, including enjoyment and passion, inspiring their journey. And their first lesson, their first session is complimentary. Now, the coach gets paid to deliver it, but the golfer that's coming, we tell them, we want to get to know you. We want to see how you play. We want to find out what you're looking for. We want to see if you like us, if you like our academy. And at the end of the session, if you're interested in moving forward with a, a program, Hey, we'd love to help you, but there's no pressure. So the coaches are trained on how to deliver a trial session. It's not a traditional golf lesson where they've got someone on video and they're it's, it's basically watching people hit, understanding what they see, seeing all their skills, finding out how they've learned the game, what they're looking for, getting to know them, the coach to introduce themselves to the student, et cetera. And then at the end of the session, uh, the coach has, is, is trained to say, look, would you like to move forward with coaching? And if they do want to move forward with coaching, we sell them a membership. So we have a bronze, silver, gold, and platinum level memberships. They have a corresponding number of credits. So to keep the math simple, a bronze level membership at our academy is $1,500. And that gives you 150 golf academy credits. So they're worth $10 each. We don't want a person, or that's the wrong word to use. We try to discourage ourselves from working with people that want to come for three lessons because nobody can win doing that. We need long-term people. So at $1,500, they get 150 credits and they can spend those credits.
however they like or however the coach recommends they spend them. So maybe a private coaching session might be 12 credits. So after they have a private coaching session, now they've got 138 credits in their golf academy bank. If they come to a performance coaching session with me, which is two hours, that's 10 credits. It's less than a, a one hour uh, private coaching session with one of our uh, one of our coaches. If they come and do a on course with a coach, that might be 16 credits, including the green fee, and so on. So we build pro. So people like it. The members love it because they can spend the credits the way they want to. The credits never go out of style. If they ever decide they don't like us anymore, they, it's their money. They get it back, and it gives the coaches enough time to really develop a plan for the golfer and then execute the plan. And it gives us time as leadership people to then, uh, to your point that you were making so well, James, in your in your um, presentation, it gives us time as leadership people to then ask the clients, what do you like? How's it going? And the good news is we've got wonderful coaches and the people love these coaches and they do a great job. But when the coaches know that we are keeping them accountable, then they do all the little things that we need them to do to make the experience even better for the golfer, to, to effectively raise the bar. So that's what we're all about. And I would I would encourage people, the coaches, to, to look through a different prism. See, back when we were all coming up, you know, James, you and I, and other people our age, it was all about how much you could make an hour. And, and of course you want to make as much money as you can. Who doesn't? But if you look at it through a different prism and go, okay, I can comfortably handle, let's pick a number, 30 committed golf students. And if I create programming, uh, that's innovative and aligns with their development. Hey, you're going to make probably way more money than if you're thinking about trying to sell them quick fix, you know, let's do a quick hit lesson and give them the total service. And, and as I said, uh, James, in our talk in, in Halifax, you know, to be their golfing Sherpa, to lead them up the mountain of golf, if you will, not just be there to fix their swing. Yeah. Fix their swing. Plus do all the other things, including, uh, taking them on vacations to, you know, support, you know, make everything, everything to do with golf. We should be their person as a PGA profession. Yeah, that that's, that's excellent. You know, it, it's, it's so much easier to maintain a relationship and keep a relationship going than to find a brand new one and start again. So the revolving door, right? Oh, did we, did Henry freeze? Oh, Scott, you, I lost you too. You're on mute. Yeah. Henry's Henry is frozen, but I, I think he'll come back. It's been a little bit. Of a minute, so there, there you are. Is. There he is. Yeah. Just froze. For a minute. And Henry, when, when you, you know, obviously what is, what is an Academy versus like what defines an Academy, I guess, like in, in, in your world, can anyone put up a tent and say, we got a great Academy or, you know, getting along those lines, kind of our last question for you with regards to your academy, for example, you just described it very well. I mean, are all your academies similar in nature with your membership and your credits, no matter which one you're, you're at, right? Yes. And you can, and the members, if, I mean, if they do travel, I mean, the, the academies are a long way, ways away. They can use them any academy. So what makes for a great academy really is great people, great people on the team who have a, a common pursuit of excellence to help golfers get better and enjoy the journey and feel proud that they have the have the background and qualifications to be professionals to charge professional service fees that are aligned with that and that get measurable results measurable yes people are getting better but they're enjoying the experience they're they're meeting it's more than just shooting lower scores for everybody it's meeting new people having new experiences it's understanding the new technology and the equipment it's it's about loving the sport and that's what we're all about so i think a great academy is about uh people that that are truly committed to helping other people uh be inspired to play better and love the sport more and if, if more of us do that then everything else will grow and there's a statistic that i just saw james a couple of days ago from uh, the proponent group uh, in orlando that uh, study has it's a great group of elite uh, level teachers and coaches and Lauren Anderson is the uh, leadership owner of that group. And he has a, a statistic that I, I think I've got it right. He says for every dollar that a person spends at a golf facility on golf instructional services, 
the facility can expect to, to get another dollar and 75 cents spent somewhere else on the property. And that's the part that we have a challenge with in today's world with owners and leadership people. They don't see the value of instruction or coaching. They think, oh, well, the coach is making all the money. We're only getting a small percentage of it. And I would encourage people to look again through a different lens and say, okay, if we have a great academy, I can promise you that all of your revenue streams will grow. I can promise you that you're going to be so much less susceptible to the downturns. It's the straw that stirs the drink if it's done well. And I really hope that we get there in my career time, because that's a part that I think that people are missing. They, they look at it like it's a standalone, you know, oh, that teacher's making money. They're making $100 an hour and all that kind of, you know, foolish talk. When really, if it's a great academy, it is great for that facility. That's selfish for the facility and, and rightly so, but it's great for the game. And we need more people that can understand that. And then the coaches, like I said, to work together to, help golfers have a great experience for sure. I love it. That's so good. So good. Henry, um, you're an educated man, obviously, you know, with all of your studying and your, and your, and, and your partnerships for a young golf professional, where would you point them to go gather, you know, first of all, go to your website and download your book and look at your master's thesis and all those other things. I would tell everybody to do that. But where else would you send people, uh, a young, you know, instructor that wants to kind of achieve the success, you know, in, in the industry like you have, where would you, where would you send them? Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Um, if you study the, the development of really good people in the industry, in, in this case, obviously the teaching and coaching side, They've almost all worked for the same small group of really good, highly established coaches and teachers. So I would suggest to a young professional, find the person that you think you might gel with in your province, your state, your country, and work for the best person you can. And do it for a long time. Don't do it for six months. Do it for six years. I worked for Paul Sherritt for 10 years. I worked for Bruce Murray and Bobby Hogarth for four years. Um, so give it the time that it needs, get, get, get with the best people, learn the trade, uh, put in your time, uh, do the work, study what you need to study. And then when you're ready, you will go to much higher heights than if you get, you know, we see so many young professionals, they, they get their PGA card as a class A member, they get it much faster now. Um, and then they think they're going to immediately, like you said earlier, James and Scott, like, uh, start a brand and, it just doesn't work out that way. So my advice would be find the best people who have a long proven track record of not only uh, doing well themselves, but helping others and get with that person or those people and, and then learn and then develop your own brand down the road. Love it. Love it. Scott, any uh, final thoughts, comments? Well, <clears throat> just wanted to say, Henry, uh, thank you so much for your time today. I've always admired your work from afar. So uh, great to finally meet you and, uh, you know, to get some insight into your business and just how you approach uh, what it is that you do was uh, was very, very interesting. I have no doubt our audience will feel the same way for those that joined us live or, you know, for people that uh, are on the gig platform later and watch this in the archive. Like just so many great takeaways and little nuggets of information that I think they can use to you know, help them in their business day to day. So just want to say thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to to be a part of this chat today. And and thanks for your support of Golf Industry Guru. We really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you, you gentlemen. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. And congratulations on all that you're doing. I really wasn't aware to the extent of, of the incredible breadth and depth of knowledge and training that you're offering. And boy, I'm super impressed with it. And I need to talk to you guys off camera on how we can get our academy involved with you guys because I know you can help us. So that's what we all should be doing is is building on other people's strengths. And uh, I look forward to having a conversation with you guys about that selfishly, but really appreciated being uh, invited to be with you and hope I helped at least uh, a person or two who might tune in. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much, Henry. And Henry, if some gorgeous, exotic look golf course around the world wants to have the Henry Brunton Academy, how do they get in touch with you? Where's the, where's the best, what's the best way to reach out to you? 
Well, I can be reached uh, at, on, our, on our website, henry at henrybrunton.com, and we are actively looking for one or two potentially uh, more academies. We really believe we have, um, you know, the recipe that we can really make a bigger impact easily and, and be a real value add to a facility or a resort or a private club. And so if anyone is interested in, in having that conversation, I would be very open to it. You know, henry at henrybrunton.com uh, and our website is, is henrybrunton.com. So thank you very much for that. Love it. Love it. Henry, thanks so much. Safe travels back to Canada. Uh, thanks, King thanks. Nation, uh, it's been wonderful to have you on another live Q&A call. Uh, so thrilled that you could listen to us today, whether it's live or it's recorded. And uh, once again, uh, have a great uh, golf day and we will see you on the inside.